I'm Mike Hendrickson from O'Reilly Media. Today I'm going to be talking with Jason Grigsby and Liza Danger Gardner, who are two of the four co-founders of Cloud4 in Portland, Oregon. Cloud4 is a company that's focused on the web, mobile, and emerging technologies. They're also the authors of O'Reilly's Head First Mobile Web Development. And today we're going to be talking about the mobile web and performance. Jason and Liza, welcome. Hi there. Hey. So I've been looking through chapter two. I mean, I think Jason kind of pointed me there a little bit and said it was a lot on performance. Um, so I'd kind of like to know what's the difference between a mobile website and a typical desktop site? I mean, are there particular characteristics that you can point out that easily indicates the difference from one from the other? I think that, that that distinction is actually getting harder and harder as time goes by to, to figure out. Um, it used to be that, like, you know, on a different namespace, sometimes a different, you know, m dot whatever or, you know, whatever dot com slash, you know, mobile or dot movie, you know, you could, you could clearly tell that something was mobile versus not. But um, a lot of the current techniques are built around responsive web design, which basically has a desktop site going all the way to mobile um, and just adapting based on the screen resolution. And in those cases, it becomes harder to tell. In fact, that's one of the things that um, uh, I think a lot of other companies are, are starting to have these challenges. Google, for example, wants to um, make decisions on how, you know, how well an, a mobile ad will do in its network based on whether or not it's optimized for mobile but their ability to tell whether or not it's optimized for mobile is more challenging when the same HTML, CSS, and JavaScript can be delivered to both the mobile site and the desktop site. I guess the, the like at what people would say is, does it look like it's been designed to fit the screen um, as like sort of the barometer for whether it's a mobile, mobile design site or not, but whether or not it is doesn't necessarily mean that it is optimized behind the scenes. So that's how you would distinguish whether it's truly a mobile site or whether it's a desktop site kind of dressed in mobile clothing? Yeah, in... you run into that a, a lot. Um, what you end up with is something that um, beautifully looks mobile and feels gorgeous on a mobile device. But if you peel back the covers of it, you'll you'll see a giant payload. You, you see indiscriminate JavaScript and images that are scaled using responsive techniques but might be enormous images in terms of actual file size. And you also see sometimes um, people kind of doing the inverse of progressive enhancement where they start with sort of a desktop metaphor and they're trying to strip it down from mobile. And there are often signs of that uh, if you look at the performance statistics. So are there any tools, particular tools, that you can use to determine whether a site's been truly designed, developed, and implemented as a mobile site? Yeah, so um, one, of, one of the favorite ones for, that I like is... Um, uh, Blaze, uh, blaze.io slash mobile has a free online test that you can do that will actually have Android and iPhone devices go out on the network and request pages and give you um, your your standard uh, waterfall chart and number of HTTP requests and total page size. Um, you have to be a little careful. Sometimes it can give you false reports because in order to get that data, they have to, they're actually you know, creating their own browser with an embedded web view that's very, very close to the native browser, but will have slightly different results. Um, the other thing that we use a lot is um, Charles Proxy on the Mac. Um, I think they may have a PC version as well, but basically you can route uh, all your phone connections through the proxy so that you can watch the traffic happen. Um, and then uh, Wyslow, the plugin that, um, that the Yahoo group created, They've just recently released a, um, uh, they've updated their, their plugin so that it will work better on mobile. Um, and of course, Steve Souders has his mobile performance bookmarklets, which are really great. Yeah. So who came up with the word greased lightning in the book? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Who, who came up with the word greased lightning in the book? I think that was you. Was it? Uh, I love that. I, I don't remember. I love that term. So. How does someone design and what, what are the considerations they have to take into effect to actually build a site that's really fast and can operate like greased lightning? I love that term. Just by the way. 
<laughs> I think that the output you get from certain of the tools Jason was just talking about, especially for me, I find that Wiselow is an exceptional tool. The criteria it's grading, it's performance um, evaluations on are very valuable to look at as you're going into designing something that you want to be fast on mobile. Um, sort of a metaphorical approach uh, that people are really uh, adhering to these days is something that is sometimes called mobile first, often also called content first design, where you really look at what your baseline experience is, um, concentrate on paring it down to that, deliver that, and again, um, performing uh, a lot of progressive enhancement is key. Uh, but looking at things specifically like number of HTTP requests, the size of your payload, concatenating JavaScript and CSS whenever possible, and some of those classic performance enhancement techniques absolutely apply to mobile just as they apply to any other website. I think one of the other things that's, that's interesting is, um, you know, uh, people have been looking at the way in which Bing and other search engines are doing things slightly differently on mobile um, to optimize because the the actual cost of an HTTP request is so much more on a mobile device versus a desktop device because of the latency of a mobile network. So Bing, for example, loads all of its JavaScript and CSS and stores it in local storage and then um, revisions it and like will download new copies if needed. But because of that, um, they're sort of counterintuitively on the first page downloading even more stuff than they normally would in order to make sure that subsequent page requests are really, really fast because they don't have to retrieve that stuff again. And again, that makes it difficult to tell if you're looking at a site that is optimized for mobile, if you're looking at it, it's just the first page request. Yeah. So Jason, without throwing you off onto a rant, because I know we've talked about this before, um, has Google improved their Android browser to catch up with their Chrome browser yet? <laughs> well, uh, there are signs that they're they're doing that because last week, uh, I think it was last week, they released a beta for Android um, of Chrome. They actually have the Chrome browser now. But so, it's on Ice so Cream Sandwich, I think, isn't it? Yeah. It's only on Ice Cream Sandwich. Who knows where they're going with it? Um, you know, I know a lot of people were critical of that decision. Um, but given that it's been, you know, it's... Android 4.0 and we're finally getting Chrome at all. Um, I feel like, you know, applauding them a little um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then hoping that they, they proceed down that path and continue down and create, you know, not only make sure that Chrome works on, on Ice Cream Sandwich, but hopefully on the older, older devices as well. Yeah, I got to admit, we all use Chrome at home. It's absolutely screaming great. So, mm -hmm. um, so. What are some of the common mistakes, the most common mistakes that developers make when building a mobile site? This is almost like the patterns that you see over and over. And I think it's actually the, a pattern in this conversation we're having right now, which is that as people try to implement those uh, responsive techniques, they tend to make beautiful sites. And unfortunately, they forget again to pull back and look at what's going on behind the scenes. And you end up with sites that look gorgeous but are not performing at all. Um, so we, you know, that's a common theme we're seeing a lot. Uh, another thing that happens is that there is, uh, it's very difficult to test these sites, of course, you know, getting a hold of a lot of uh, browsers and devices is very challenging. And there tends to be an assumption that if it performs well and works well on new phones like iOS and Android, that you've kind of nailed it. And unfortunately, just because you haven't tested it doesn't mean it works. Um, so there's this sort of WebKit only or iOS only approach that is is a bit difficult. Yeah, I think to Liza, I think Liza was the first one to coin this phrase, but we we repeat it a lot here, which is um, simply that if you think that your site's really working, you just haven't tested it enough uh, mobile browsers yet, <laughs> because it's broken somewhere. You just haven't found it. And then I would say that the other thing that happens is if you go away from a responsive design um, and you're actually using device detection, which we talk about in the book, um, that people make sort of bad assumptions about what somebody's doing on a mobile device. And so they really dumb down the experience for mobile. And, you know, when 25% of the people on accessing the mobile web in the United States only access it from a mobile device, um, they don't access it via desktop or infrequently access it via desktop they're going to want to do things that those of us who have access to a desktop machine wouldn't consider doing on their phone because that's, you know, like filling out a job application. You know, if you can't fill out a job application on your mobile device, 
you're excluding a certain percentage of the population where that's the only device that they have access to. Yep. Um, so I think people who do separate sites have a whole other set of things that they have to worry about. Um, a little less on the performance side, a little bit more on like actually building something that works well. Well, working at all is the first performance step they've taken. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, two terms I found in chapter two, and, and again, this is your head first mobile web book. Um, there are two terms in there that I think are really important. I'm not sure where they go and what, what happens with them. One of them, I think, actually should be a conference. I mean, I, I love the idea of mobile first um, as the name for a conference because I don't think there is one like that anywhere where you go and you learn about mobile first, but that's another story. But can you two talk a little bit about progressive enhancement and mobile first responsive web design? Yeah, so um, progressive enhancement was uh, a phrase coined a few years ago um, uh, to describe sort of starting from a, a, a baseline experience and then progressively enhancing so like making enhancements to the to the web page based on the capabilities of the browser. Um, and that was in contrast to what had previously been done, which was graceful degradation, which was you delivered the best possible experience to the best browsers and then um, strip stuff away. Um, mobile first is two things. One, it's um, what Luke Rablewski coined as a phrase, because what he was seeing was that from a design perspective, um, if you simply started from mobile, it, it basically forced you because of the constraints to focus in on what really mattered. And so your InDesigns, even for desktop, ended up better. When it came to mobile first responsive web design, what we realized was that that sort of mentality applied to responsive design was very helpful because then you'd start from a baseline sort of um, experience, progressively enhance it up to desktop, and you end up with, um, you, it's essentially progressive enhancement as we've known it in the past, but in the past, what we were looking at was prim primarily device capabilities. So does this thing support rounded corners? If so, you know, the CSS would provide rounded corner support. Instead, we're saying let's progressively enhance based on screen size. Um, and that's, that's really sort of the fundamental difference. So mobile first ends up encapsulating both sort of like a mentality and a philosophy um, as well as, you know, actual techniques of starting with mobile um, HTML and CSS and JavaScript and um, sort of progressively enhancing it up to desktop. Did I get that right, Liza? You okay. generally did. Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Excellent. So as you're progressively enhancing and you're thinking about the mobile experience, you know, I know on my Android phone, I think I have four or five browsers on there. How do you, how does someone who's progressively enhancing do they keep five different code sets or five different, you know, how do you do that sort of thing when you're targeting so many different browsers on, you know, Android alone, there are so many devices and so many browsers. How do you handle that? You really don't. What you do okay. is you start with a really good core baseline in that sort of mobile first approach. You progressively enhance based on features that the browser supports. Um, you do, you sprinkle in some known techniques that work across a whole lot of different browsers. You really make sure your code is valid because the different browsers and devices are really intolerant of flaky code. You test as much as you can and then you kind of cross your fingers. But your best tactic is to start with something basic, clean, and valid and build up from there. So even for the browsers and devices you couldn't possibly think of, know of, or test on, you have a good chance of it working and working gracefully. Uh, Liza's absolutely right. Um, I would add that you should drink um, a lot. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's a little early to talk about Android fragmentation here on the West Coast. And, and even WebKit fragmentation, all that. Yeah. It, it's it's a zoo out there. And it's, and it's I mean, the thing that, that, um, that we, both Liza and I were involved with the creation of a website called Future Friendly, which is futurefriend.ly. Um, and like a lot of what we were looking at was simply that um, the device, the device diversity is just going to get worse. Like it's not going to get better. Um, I, you know, smart TVs, tablets, yeah. like mobile yeah. phones are the day, the problem for today, but there's other stuff coming down I've the pipe. I've got a watch coming. 
and a nice exactly. Android watch from IM Watch. It's going to be awesome. And I think that a lot of the performance techniques that we're looking at as being essential to reach mobile browsers are really a harbinger of just the proliferation of platforms, devices, and browsers we're going to see. It's not just going to be mobile. It's going to be everything. Yeah. Well, you know, Liza, you mentioned, uh, and I think this is, this is where the crux of it is, sprinkle in some techniques that you've learned. Where do people learn those techniques? I mean, are there best practices? Are there, there are ways that your average programmer can pick this up, or how, how does that happen? I can't tell a lie. It is a very challenging landscape right now to be successful on the mobile web. At this point, I do have to mention that in our book, we try to give an introduction to all of the core techniques that are currently in circulation. Right. And part of what we aim to uh, help readers understand and learn is how to pick and choose from all of those ingredients based on what your project requirements are and what you're trying to achieve. Because unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. There is no one answer. And it really requires developers and designers with a lot of common sense and willingness to solve problems to figure it out right now. Yeah, it's just early. I mean, we we built the web to solve the problems of the last decade, and we're we're now facing a new decade of problems. And so, consequently, uh, we're building tools and um, infrastructure and things to support that. And so, you know. It's a little bit, I think the, the core thing is to get an understanding of what the tools are out, what tools are out there and sort of lay on the land of the fundamental techniques. And that's, that's really, I think, what, um, I mean, I don't want to plug the book, but one of the things that we really took a lot of pride in is the fact that the book covers that range of stuff, whether it's, you know, building sites or all the way up to building apps with PhoneGap, um, so that somebody can understand, as Liza was talking about, like, Okay, here are my options. What's the problem that I've got right now? What What's the best solution for that particular problem? And chances are the in solution is going to be not just one of those techniques. It's going to be some combination of those techniques. You know, I know you, you mentioned it's early, and it, it is early, but it, it's really odd. I just did some analysis on the book market, and the iPad was not even a category three years ago. And now it's almost as large as Windows 7 for book sales. I mean, that's a desktop platform that every enterprise typically supports and has. And the iPad is almost as big. And that mobile driver, I can't imagine that things are going to slow down or get easier. It's probably going to be no. more acceleration. No, but it's also, I mean, uh, it was kind of boring before mobile came around. So we got complacent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, everything, everything was all standardized and commoditized and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and now there's great opportunity to differentiate people, your skill set based on your understanding of these, um, sort of what's happening and opportunity to build infrastructure. And it's just, it's fun in a way that it wasn't hard, fun, hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of Mary Meeker at Web 2.0 Summit um, said something like, uh, fortunes will be made and destroyed in the mobile space in the next three years. You know, and I, right. you really see that happening so quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's going to impact every industry. It's not, it's not just the, I mean, she talks specifically about uh, technology companies and when she's talking about disruptive technology and technology cycles and, the winners of the last technology cycle not being the winner of the next technology cycle. Yeah. Um, but it's also true that, you know, booksellers were dramatically impacted by the desktop internet um, compute technology cycle. And there are companies, we're working with a company, for example, that is in the coupon space, and they weren't impacted by the desktop internet um, because it didn't make a lot of sense for people to go back to their computers and print coupons. Like they just did, it wasn't a consumer behavior. But they are dramatically going to be impacted by mobile coupons, yeah. um, and they recognize that, and they're they're attempting to change their business around it. Well, I see that all the time when I check in now with Foursquare. You know, Whole Foods mm -hmm. always has some sort of offer for me now, and it's almost like it's learning where I'm going and has those coupons ready for me. I don't use yeah. them, but it's a good idea. Um, Jason and Eliza, thank you for your time, and I hope we see you at Velocity or our other conferences coming up this year, and um, hope it's all, all well and good in Portland. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.